All right, so in today's Wine How, we are going to uh, go through a navigation of the postdoctoral funding landscape. And um, do you think we need the lights down? And these are mostly words, right? I'm just thinking I'm ready to fall asleep to. Uh, oh, we, uh, no, we can, we can leave the lights on. Yeah, Perhaps. We can see the audience and maybe take yeah. questions as we go. Yeah, right. I think that sounds good. Maybe we can leave or have it a little bit lighter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, and this is meant. This is meant to be. That was kind my of one contribution to this talk. Right? <laughs> Excellent. Please turn you're, the lights on. You've done your. Can I go now? Not quite. <laughs> but um, uh, so it's meant to be like a really open session, an interactive session. It's not. We we do have some slides that we're going to go over to give structure to the talk, but it's um, it, it, it's really meant for you to ask questions throughout the talk and we'll have some discussions on certain topics as well as we go along. So do feel free and chime in and um, let us know if you have questions as we go through this. Um, but maybe first of all, let's start, of course, with the question, why should you secure postdoc funding? You're here, you're um, either already a postdoc or maybe a future postdoc or a past postdoc. Um, uh, but in general, postdoc funding uh, really involves you writing a grant yourself. And that's really, really important if you want to stay in academic research or really in other types of research as well, because you got to um, learn how to write and compete for grants. It's a big part of this job. Um, and, and almost a big part of any job. And exactly, exactly. So really, if you're going in industry, you still have to sell your ideas to you know your peers and your bosses and whatever else. And that's what writing a grant is. Exactly, exactly. You got to put your ideas on paper, and and a grant is a way to do that really. Um, and it it's really a also a um, structured way to write down and, and, and formulate your own research ideas um, for a project that you would want to do. Um, so those are good things to learn, first of all. But then also, of course, if you are successful in getting a grant or a fellowship, um, that's a great thing for everyone involved in that research, really. Um, but specifically for you, it gives you freedom to start establishing your own um, project, to establish a little bit more of your independence um, as, uh, from your mentor. Um, and at the same time, you're still going to be in a structured lab where you can get all that mentorship um, and you have, a, uh, you have um, defined projects. But it's really a first step to becoming more independent. It's a great thing to add to your CV. Uh, um, uh, sh having demonstrated that you've been able to successfully compete for fellowships and grants uh, before you start um, the next stage of your career um, will make you more competitive in general. So for I guess the rest of this hour we're going to talk about how we you should secure postdoc funding. Um, really we can summarize it in one slide. Um, but we're going to go over some more details. Um, uh, this is from PhD Comics. Of course, you know, ideally you write the grant, you get the money, you do your research, and then you publish your results. Um, practically speaking, uh, I think once you get into uh, research and projects, um, uh, you know, the, the, that, that cycle of, of project and funding is, uh, might turn out to be a little bit different. Um, to, to that traditional way of thinking. Um, but, but overall, that, that doesn't really matter so much. Uh, um, I think what you, we're going to talk about how to get funding for your research, but I think in general, it's important to keep in mind, you know, do, like, do the research that you're excited to do. Um, find something you're passionate about that you want to um, work on. And those are, those are, good ideas that then transpire into grants. It's not the grant itself that sparks these ideas. It's the other way around. Um, and uh, of course, you need funding and money to actually be able to do certain things. Um, uh, but 
it's really the the science that should drive all of those funding applications in the first place. So just keep that in mind. Um, I will say I, I disagree with this, uh, although that how it really works is closer to true than the one above it. <laughs> the, the one thing I disagree with, just for you know future reference, whatever, that second one, get results, but don't publish them yet, call them preliminary results. It's all true, I think, except for the don't publish it yet. You can publish your preliminary and it can still be preliminary results. I, I wouldn't hold back your publications to get your grants out the door. Um, you may yet have to spin the grant and you know, you may have to describe your paper as the preliminary study that your grant is based on, but it's always good to have the paper written. So, uh, you know, that's close to right, but not exactly right. Get the paper out the door. And then when you're describing it as preliminary, you know, you'll say that the 20 patients you imaged are just really allows you to do the power analysis and by golly, you really need to do, you know, 100 more patients or something. Um, but yeah, don't hold your papers back. Go out and publish. <laughs> but please go ahead. Yeah. So we should edit this don't take it too little. <laughs> exactly. It's close, but not entirely. Right. All right. But now on to more um, practical things. Um, so there are different types of sources for of postdoc funding that you can consider to apply for, which are going to be relevant at, when you're at different stages in your career or at different, um, uh, really in different places. Um, so one way to think about it is, is that there is institutional money. And so here at MGH, um, there is the executive, uh, ECOR, Executive Committee of Research, which is a, um, an, an, an entity that gives out grants um, as one of many things. Um, and so in terms of postdoctoral grants, one of the main grants here um, that are known for is really the TOSTASAN and the Fund for Medical Discovery Fellowship. Um, this grant um, basically allows you to get a, um, an annual stipend of 50K um, plus indirect costs and um, there are three application deadlines throughout the year. Um, uh, also, the, I think these slides are going to be available. Just these slides are going to be available for you afterwards, so you can get the slides and look at the links and so forth, and look at more details of, of everything yourself. Uh, but um, it's really meant to support uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, there are two calls, I think, that are for everyone and then there's one call that's specifically for clinical research which means clinical research i believe is defined actually any any research that requires an irb so any and you don't have to be an md to do that research but i think it's basically human um, subject research um but maybe check on that <laughs> um and so those are their application is pretty easy um they are because mgh is such a large institution, they are actually end up actually being pretty competitive. But well, that's not a good reason not to apply. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward, and it's like kind of a first, a really good entry step to to put in a first fellowship application. I would say. Great. Um, yes. Well, the presumption is you're still going to be a postdoc for another yeah. year. Yeah. So if you've been yeah. a postdoc for five years and kind of the nominal limit is five years, you know, that's maybe not the best time to put it in. But, you know, and in a competitive environment, you're being compared against other people. And if you have more papers, whatever, in other words, if you're a little further in your postdoc, that actually probably doesn't hurt you. So, um, you know, I mean, no reason not to try. You can do one every calendar year. So, I mean, you can do it in your first year, but uh, if you don't get it, keep trying. You know, um, maybe by your fifth year, it's time to be thinking about other things. <laughs> yes. Do people need the sort of, you know, consent from their PIs before applying for these grants? Or, you know, whenever they want, they just want to, you know, apply and know who cares about the PI thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you, uh, essentially, yes, essentially, yes. You don't need per consent per se, but yes, you do need for all the postdoc applications, effectively, I think all of them that 
we're going to go through, you need a, po a mentor. They are postdoctoral grants or fellowships, which by definition means that you are a trainee, so there will be a mentor that mentors you, and that will be part of the application, and that's going to be an important part of the application usually. So, you, um, uh, so that's one reason why you need uh, consent. You probably need a letter from your mentor, and so and and write something about that mentor relationship um, and why they are a good mentor to mentor you on this particular project. Um, second, you want to discuss these kinds of applications with your mentor. Um, it, you, it, I think in general, you just want to make them aware that you're applying or discuss whether you should be applying. Sometimes there are certain time constraints, like when, because your mentor will have, might have grants as well. If there are certain specific deadlines, maybe it's good to discuss when it's a good time to apply or kind of discuss or maybe what your publication record looks like, when is a good time for you personally to just apply. So it's good to have that conversation with your mentor. Great. Great question. I think that's pretty much the only opportunity within MGH as far as I'm aware. So sure. I'm sorry there's not more, <laughs> but uh, that that's the one within MGH. Uh, but uh, luckily, speak, uh, luckily there are several other opportunities. And so, these are effectively non-federal uh, opportunities, which are generally foundations or societies. And one of uh, uh, really just some examples of this are um, really um, foundations that provide, that are usually specialized um, uh, non-profit non uh, entities that have a particular interest like the American Heart Association, which um, uh, allows you to apply for grants in cardiovascular research, or in, in the other case, the Brain and Behavior Foundation, which is looking at really um, psychiatry and mental health and drug addiction. Um, these are just, I'm just, I just put up two examples here. There, there are a ton of uh, um, uh, foundations, but they usually have a very narrow focus. And so, um, it only makes sense to apply if you are within that, um, if your research falls into that topic of interest for the foundation. Um, and so, uh, but most, uh, like a lot of foundations do have postdoctoral fellowships. And so I'm just listing here two that are, um, that are uh, probably quite, or that are quite big foundations and that have, um, of a proven track workers. I think people here have gotten these kinds of fellowships before as well. But um, I'm also putting a few links here that you can just use to then search for your own field and see what kind of societies exist, what kind of postdoc opportunities, uh, postdoc funding opportunities exist um, in, in these cases. In general, I think foundations tend to have application deadlines once a year. So if you've just missed one, you're probably gonna have to wait a year. Um, that's not true for all of them, but generally, I think that's pretty much the case. Um, and I would just encourage you to just read very carefully what their application guidelines are and the eligibility requirements. They all differ. There's no common ground um, between them. They can make their own decisions as to um, funding. But it, as you can see, like on the AHA, you know, the success rate that's significantly better than the FMDs, uh, you know, the MGH FMDs. Some of the success rates are, are quite good. Uh, I mean, they're all competitive, but, you know, some are, you know, uh, have more, you know, slots relative to applicants than others. And so if you fit that criteria, you should take advantage of it. Yeah. And, and there are lots and lots of them. You know, it's, your PI should know of some, but uh, these are great sources to look at. Um, you know, you can often recycle, you know, one application to more than one, and that's fair game. You know, it's a setting where self-plagiarism is acceptable if you're submitting similar grants to multiple places at once. I mean, the notion is you're not going to take more than one, but you can submit more than, you know, one. Probably should submit more than one if, if your work is eligible to two or three or four. Get those applications out there. Exactly. I think they're actually often, I, I, 
the success rate, uh, the relatively high success, most of them, most like the American Heart Association, they actually publish their success rates, which is nice, but not uh, most of them, you yeah. don't know what it is, but they tend to be better than other federal grants or even the MJH ECOR mm -hmm. uh, grants, uh, just because they're more niche and they're sometimes underutilized in terms of just few applicants. Um, yeah, um, then I just wanted to mention, so there are a couple of special programs out there that are, that have, I, would, I would say actually come up probably over the past, you know, five years or so, which uh, really try to enrich the uh, diversity of uh, researchers. Um, and so there is a, um, uh, uh, from the Boris Welcome Fund, which is also a big um, Philanthropic Foundation, they have a um, postdoctoral award, um, which is specifically for minority applicants. Um, and so that provides actually a stipend for three years. So that's a really good, um, uh, it, it's a really good supplement or, or a really good addition to what you can. So if you do fall into that category, I would um, urge you to watch out for special calls like this. Um, there's also from the Howard Hugh Medical Institute, um, again, a really big foundation that has diff all sorts of different types of grants. They launched a um, Hannah Gray Fellows Program, which supports um, also in uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, and specifically, again, this is the call is only out for minorities, uh, but also uh, female applicants. So um, it's, all of these are really highly competitive um, applic uh, applications, actually. So I don't think they're easy to get, um, but they are, they're just special calls that are uh, worth looking out for if you do fall into that category. And they are, they are, they're great programs because all of these fellowships are in general competitive. Um, so if you do get it, it really says something um, about you as a researcher. Um, yeah, um, then uh, I think we just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, just touch on just awards in general, awards for trainees, which are, so these are not grants or fellowships, but they are almost equally important for your postdoctoral career um, as getting a fellowship potentially. Um, and so there are some that are really obvious so that probably a lot of you have heard about. Um, these are uh, travel awards or stipends for conferences. Um, pretty much all of most conferences uh, have, uh, uh, have some kind of support um, for travel awards for stipends. If you do submit an abstract to a conference in order to help you attend the conference to give you support, um, uh, to give you basically money to do to attend that that conference. There are some some are really easy to get. Some are really competitive. Um, but again, it depends on what what conference and what society you're part of. Um, and it's always worth watching out for those. And it's always worth applying because um, you it, usually the application is very very little work. But if you do get it, it's it's just a great feature and it's another, you know, add-on to your CV as well. So it, I wouldn't dismiss those either. And your uh, your mentors will also appreciate it. <laughs> it's a win all round. And then beyond travel awards, there are all sorts of other awards. Um, I don't think we're covering all of them here, but things to look out for and to watch out for is really best paper awards. Um, journals will have those. Um, they sometimes get automatically picked. Sometimes it's literally just ticking a box on a submission. Um, uh, sometimes it's tied to a conference and a conference submission. Um, uh, there are also often post awards that are given out at conferences um, or, or best presentation awards. All of those are, are, are really good to participate in and um, just to get experience, but also to get these awards, is it's going to be good for you. Um, within MGH, there is, I think, an annual research fellow poster celebration where you can submit an abstract to and you uh, present a poster. And again, well, they there's, there's one for our department. There's one institutionally. That's right. 
So there's at least two. There's, yeah. there's probably a few others uh, lurking out there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, better the five hundred dollars in your pocket than somebody else's. <laughs> um, so awards are good for you. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And and usually it's not that much work to actually apply for any of these. So um, why not go for it? Um, all right, and that brings us to NIH funding, federal funding. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, that, that's a great, that, that, that's a great question. Um, it, it, so I don't think awards generally have a, have a limitation, but the fellowships, they do sometimes have limited. It really depends on, especially with the foundations. Um, some of them are open to, to citizenship, uh, to internationals. Some of them are not. Um, but I would say in general, the foundations and, and like the Tosses are open. I would say more foundations are open than are closed. For the government, it's kind of the other way around, uh, as we'll talk about. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there are certainly exceptions, but, um, you know, many of the foundations are, are open to international candidates, uh, you know, read the rules, but definitely don't hesitate to look because you'll find that there are certainly plenty that are open to international candidates. Right. But as Christine said, not all of them are. Yeah. The other, the other thing that I think we are not really touching on is that if you are an international, um, it's worth looking at for opportunities from outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. as well. There are a lot of um, uh, uh, foundations or really governmental support often that can that where you apply in your home country or um, yeah, usually in your home country um, We're and here to exactly to come study in the US or so even while you're already in the US some of them are open to give you additional support um, so those are open to you specifically and so it's worth watching out for those there they're definitely there's like the Marie Curie in Europe um, uh, there are Canadian postdoctoral fellowships I don't know what they're yes thank you <laughs> Money from your country and you're in a chain one, you might try to come on. Yeah. Check the local yeah. rules for sure, but I think it's a really good point to be on the lookout for them. If you don't look for them, you won't find them. Yeah. I just heard that uh, the That's a quite, uh, it, it was a very, um, uh, very well publicized affair, something to take note of. We can maybe talk about that in some other setting. I, I think for this discussion, the trouble he got into is, is probably uh, uh, not so relevant. Um, but it, it, his big issue was he didn't disclose what he had done, the money he had taken and the arrangements he had in China. For any of these fellowships, there's not a question of disclosure. So you're not going to run into these kind of issues. You can uh, you can take money if the, if the Chinese government has a fellowship and you can apply for it and get it, get it, take it. You're not going to get arrested for that. Um, just don't you know hide the money, right? You know just uh, you know just disclose. So his big problem was he hid the fact that he was getting this money rather than disclosing it. Uh, it's it's. It, it's, it is a very interesting and important topic, but probably not so interesting and relevant for this conversation. You shouldn't lose sleep over that. I, on the other hand, have lost some sleep over that. Well, That's I, a separate I issue. Say, the two-year conference, you're still not going to share the verification. Like, but if you use money from your country and then you say, um, then you have to do a two-year conference. And so like, um, even though when you come with the say, that rule doesn't apply in my data. So yeah, that's a, that's a separate issue of this home residency yeah, yeah, that's requirement, right? Theory, but like, yeah. I, I'm that's different than the chemistry professor who got himself arrested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
the, I, I think that what you're re referring to, like the the J1 home residence, it's just something to consider that, yeah, if you bring money from outside, talk to someone else that has done that before um, and ask them about some of the visa consequences that happen from that. If you were to stay longer in the US than just that fellowship period, um, it, it's worth being aware of it. I think that that's right. Great question. Yeah. Good question. So, uh, when you usually apply for non-federal funding or institutional funding, your problem look at if, if they want funded, like, if, will this translate to federal funding in the long run? Will this translate, like, that might be a factor when they decide, but federal funding usually they don't fund, like, high-risk, high-reward projects. So, how good are, like, these non-federal funding sources in, like, funding, like, high-risk, high-reward projects? Compared to you know, in my experience, you know, in the end of the day, you should put forward the science that you want to do. Uh, you know, like anything, it's being reviewed by, you know, peers, usually, you know, more senior peers, uh, and they're going to look at the project and say, you know, is this going to work, right? As a training exercise, you know, pursuing a project that has a very small likelihood of working, one could argue is not the best training exercise. Um, so putting something very speculative forward, I mean, you have to be prepared for people to raise some questions. Having said that, the reverse is also true, that while the federal government, exactly as you say, is, tends to be very conservative, usually it's the foundations that will fund work earlier in the process, before you have a lot of preliminary data, the higher risk things, and then the federal dollars come after you've shown that it does work and you can collect the data and you can do it. So in general, and this is true at faculty levels as well, foundation grants are a good source to go to for things that aren't quite NIH ready. You know, to write an NIH R01, you need to have five papers on the subject. Even a care award, the assumption is you've already kind of established that, you know, this can be done. Foundations are usually more willing to take risks on good ideas because they tend to be more focused on the individual, like are they a good risk, rather than the science itself. But the, you know, the thing to keep in mind is if you propose something that just doesn't sound credible, it doesn't make you sound credible. And you know, that, that will be, you know, kind of, that'll count against you. Um, but in general, you should put forward the ideas that you are most excited about. And as long as you have a good case to make that you're going to learn something, uh, you know, uh, scientifically, as well as in the process yourself, new techniques, whatever, you know, I think foundations are, are good to go for some of these ideas that are, you know, not quite ready for NIH funding. Uh, how transparent is the process of the foundations as compared to the NIH? In terms of mm. like, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. So usually foundations, um, there's much, well, you don't, tend to get feedback on your application generally because they don't spend they they don't have the time or resources to spend on anyone uh, really writing a you know a, a page review for your application so basically the answer you get is either you know you get funded or not and so that sometimes it's hard to assess whether how if your application did not get funded how excited they were about the application itself. Um, I, I would say that's the biggest difference between the federal and um, uh, non-federal It does depend on the foundation. Some foundations, if you call the, like the program officers, they'll give you some feedback. They might encourage you to apply again. In others, exactly as you say, you know, you, you get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you get nothing and you like it. <laughs> Um, if you're thinking of applying a second time, then you would want some feedback so that you can improve the application. You, you can call the program people. Some, some are helpful in some foundations. You know, they feel a, a, a real obligation to support the young investigators in the process, and others just say, sorry, we don't, you know, solicit and you don't get anything. Yeah. Also, just one thing to keep in mind is that even if your application doesn't get funded, um, you, you keep whatever research ideas you put on paper, right? Um, 
And usually it's a really great start to taking that and using that as an applic as, as your next application, it, whether that's then maybe a federal grant that um, is more extensive to to put in and to write. Um, but it's already you've got already got a you know a write up of your ideas and that's like more valuable than you might think, even if your that original application didn't get funded. I mean, you certainly wrote a few postdoctoral, you know. Yeah. Years, you, know, <laughs> you ended up doing brilliantly, but not every one was a great success. But they certainly yeah. were models that you built upon. As right. Subsequent ones, you know, uh, right. got generated. Right. 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 No, that's right. And and to be honest, I think the would you might not get feedback from the submission process, but you should get feedback from the people around you, like from from. Uh, your mentors from your PIs or or so from people your, your peers like people around you that that um, that you know that you might not be working with but that have some idea of what you're doing those are great sources of face feedback once you have a written grant application but no one can give you that feedback if you don't have a written grant application there's that and I don't know, maybe I'll talk about it more is you have to be prepared to share your thoughts. Some people just, they don't have enough confidence in themselves or a little nervous, whatever, they're reluctant to share. But of course, if you don't share it, you're not going to get any feedback. So you have to just like, be prepared, you know, thicken your skin a little bit, you know, ask for the hard feedback and, and share it, get it out there. Um, even if it seems hard, even if you're a little embarrassed, you knew it wasn't the best grant ever. See how other people relate to it. Right. have to put yourself out there a little bit <laughs> because this, the, the review is going to be critical so better for you to get the feedback you know before the grant goes out from your peers yeah and also uh, maybe as a word of encouragement just keep in mind in terms of grant funding in general and you you learn this over time and you're putting in an application throughout your research career you're going to get much more grants rejected than accepted um, the likelihood of your grant being rejected is much higher than it getting accepted. Um, uh, and, and so you shouldn't be discouraged if you submitted an application and you and it, it didn't come through, it wasn't positive. It's, it's, it's part of the process, but like, I think, like I said, those ideas still remain. That doesn't mean that those ideas are bad. Um, uh, it just meant that this time around, they weren't picked for funding. Um, so just don't be discouraged by getting a rejection. Um, you can be you can be discouraged for an evening. Go out, <laughs> have a have a drink, <laughs> cry in your beer, but then you got to pick yourself up and keep going. It's excellent advice. All right, so let's talk about uh, federal funding, and I think we're practically effectively you're just going to talk about NIH funding um, because that's the most relevant in our field. Um, there's all, of course also the National Science Foundation if you do a truly basic biomedical science, uh, basic science doesn't, not even biomedical, but um, uh, there are other opportunities there if you do and fall in that field, but most, for most of you it'll be NIH that's relevant. Um, and so you can go to their uh, website on research training um, that will have, that actually has a really good overview of the entire career path. And they have grants available starting from undergraduate uh, so education. Degree. Sorry? Cradle to grade. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and uh, uh, from starting from an undergraduate and of course, you know, all the way throughout the end of your career. Uh, until you want to retire, maybe. <laughs> um, but what's most relevant for you is uh, maybe to just understand the codes that the NIH uh, that the NIH um, uses for the grant designations. And so um, this is a summary here. T is for training. Those are generally institutional grants um, that you don't personally apply for, but say. Um, but a faculty um, uh, applies for within an institution. And sometimes there are um, uh, 
uh, slots for so-called T32 grants. Um, those are uh, postdoctoral slots that are uh, where, where an entire program is funded within a department um, and, and can then recruit um, uh, postdocs on those fellowships. I, I think there's then a, a selection of who, who gets those fellowships, but so you can end up being on a T grant fellowship um, if there is one available within the institution. I don't. I, I know at least three. You know, yeah, that, so that people in our universe are kind of eligible for the postdoc level. But you're right. That's not a grant you apply for. Yeah. Well, that's actually some I, of them. No, you. Yeah, you can. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a slightly different thing, but sure. No, yeah, that's true. Some of them are. They're like internal grants. Right. It's, it's like the yeah, that's right. Engineering, uh, you know, grant that uh, Jonathan Rosan has. That's a T thirty two, but you put in an application yeah. you know, to this local group. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the standard. I guess it can, it can differ. Whoever whoever has the whoever grant, the the whoever grant. the PI of the grant is, can can have different processes of how to select candidates for that. Um, uh, but what's I think probably most relevant for you is uh, the F grant. So those are fellowships. Um, and then we're also going to talk about K grants and K awards, which are then as the next step, if you are a more senior postdoc and going on to a faculty appointment, which really allow you to do career development. Um, but then, uh, and then once you are a faculty or, you know, if you're working with your PI, you probably have heard about R grants, which are really true research grants. Um, so R01 is the standard really mechanism for a big grant to launch a, a, a big uh, project. Um, and you might be involved in working on those together with your uh, mentor or PI. And so that's one way to to learn a little bit about how that grant structure works. But for you, for today's purpose, we're gonna talk about F and K awards. So at the postdoctoral, so they are, uh, so at, at the postdoctoral level, there's an F32 grant. Um, uh, there is also an F31, um, which is at the graduate level um, that you can apply for. Uh, but as a postdoc and the F32s, um, in this case, these are only open to US citizens or permanent residents. And, but they are uh, uh, good grants that provide up to three years of support for your entire postdoc. Um, you can apply for this grant either somewhat early in your postdoc years, probably in year one or two. I mean, if you've already done a postdoc for four years, I, I mean, it's possible to apply. You don't have to take three years of support, but um, it might be worth having a conversation whether you still want to apply for that. Um, but you can also apply before you even start your postdoc position. So um, you would want to identify a mentor as well as the institution where you're going to actually do the postdoc because the application has to go in through that. Somebody mechanism. just asked me this the other day. So you can apply for an F32 even before your degree is in hand? Yes. Now, what, are there any specific rules around that or? Mm, I don't know that, I don't know the details, but yes, absolutely. You can apply before you have your degree. It's not, it's just, I think it's certainly for you to start the award. Mm -hmm. You will then have to show that you have gotten the degree. Um, but you don't have to wait till you Somebody you're... just was asking me this. Okay. I, I was embarrassed that I didn't remember the numbers. I should have known from last year. <laughs> I was at the same talk. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's ideally you can, you actually want to apply, I would say maybe something like, you know, six months. Yeah. In your last year of graduate school or like maybe six months be, or well, even before. Yeah. That's what it was. Thank you. <laughs> It just came. Yeah, I, I know it's familiar. <laughs> so there's the answer to your question. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's good to apply. Basically, think about this in your last year when you're effectively thinking about your next step in your career. When you know you have a graduation date set, you're pretty sure that you're going to graduate um, around that time. 
and and you are you're then applying for positions. Um, but you, you certainly can apply for it after you, you know the people in this room. Yes. Probably largely are eligible, with some exceptions. If this is your fifth or sixth year, perhaps. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So so you can absolutely apply once you've started your postdoc. Right. Um. Yes. Sir, I have a question. Something I'm always confused about when I look at these uh, things. The NIDID King ninety nine application, which I just double checked in case it changed says that they only support up to $50,000 per year for salary. Mm -hmm. And according to that chart, let's say there's a postdoc in this room with three years of support or three years of experience that is at 53,000. Mm -hmm. This kind of implies that a grant that they might have to like take a pay cut in order to apply. So you know that, that difference between what a postdoc might be making and what NIDIB supports can that difference be supported by federal funding, or is that a discussion about like non-federal funding? It can be. It can be supported by federal uh, funds now. It didn't used to be the case, okay. but it actually can now. Yes. <laughs> I think they made it. I think they made that change last year. It used to be that you have to use, you know, sundry or like non-federal right. funds, but they, but there is a they changed that. Um, so yes, you, it can be supplemented. It, it has to be, uh, there are certain rules around, I think it has to be different, certainly has to be a different project. And so, but, so, but it can, there's no restriction that you can't do it out of, out of the batch. Yeah, they changed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a detail. If you're applying for maybe a K99, you can talk to Rob about maybe. <laughs> There's some unfortunate idiosyncrasies when it comes to these salary issues that do come up from time to time. I know some of you have run yeah. across that, but yeah. should not discourage you from looking at these and considering them seriously. Yeah, right. Um, there are, uh, there, there are, um, there's something called an F33 that seems to be really rare. I've never met anyone that has applied or gotten these, but they do exist, um, which is really a fellowship for very senior fellows um, where they can get up to two years of support if you want to make a major change in your direction of your career at the postdoctoral stage after you've already done a postdoc. Um, I'm not very familiar with those mechanisms, but they do exist. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's that's basically at the postdoctoral level. Those are um, the awards, and there there are several. And if you're considering applying for these, you should talk to people that have applied around you. There are a number within the Martino Center that have applied, um, so it's worth definitely worth having a conversation with, um, finding out who they are, and and having a conversation with um, how the application experience was. Yeah, get a copy of their grant. <laughs> Just ask nicely. Most people will say yes. Right. If they say no, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe in terms of timeline, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you haven't applied for NIH grants before, uh, it takes a while for these grants to be reviewed and then for the money to appear. Um, the, generally from the time of submission of your grant until you can see the money. I think the earliest that you can see, yeah, get that fellowship is probably nine months. Um, that's probably the, the fastest timeline. Um, often, it's, often it's longer than that. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. If you're thinking of applying, it's, it's probably worth applying earlier rather than later. Kind of like uh, voting, uh, apply early and often. <laughs> Nobody got that joke. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago style. <It's>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I think that brings us to kind of the the final piece of this, which is really the transition to faculty and your career development beyond being a postdoc. And there are different kinds of mechanism for that, um, for that transition. Um, uh, one of them is the K99 RZ0 that Rob had um, talked about uh, just a little bit earlier, 
This is called the Pathway to Independence Award. Um, this is open to both national and international applicants. Um, it's the only K award that is. It, exactly. So there are other K award that um, that we're going to I have on the next slide, um, but but it's this is the only uh, yeah the the only K award that you can apply for as an international applicant. You have to apply within four years of getting your doctoral degree. Um, that means the application has to be submitted within four years of that date. Um, and, and you also have to be a postdoc to apply. So if you're not a postdoc anymore, or if you're really, uh, say, in, within this system, an instructor, you can't apply for this mechanism anymore. Um, and it provides two years of postdoctoral funding. So it's a, uh, they call it a kangaroo grant um, because it's a two plus three year funding. Um, it's two years of postdoctoral funding, two years of really mentored funding, and then three years, which is called the R00 phase, which really transitions you into a full blown independent research grant, uh, um, uh, which is really the launching of a faculty career. And you need to get and, and and really um, uh, score a faculty position for that R00 phase. So there's, it, it's That's dependent, a it's a requirement. So it's, if you don't get a faculty position for that R00 phase, you also don't get the grant. Um, that being said, these grants are, um, they are highly competitive. So if you do get one of these grants, um, you're also viewed generally very favorably as a faculty can, it's, it's a really good stamp that you've already proven that you have successfully scored uh, federal funding. Um, so uh, there, there's a, a lot of, a little bit of a circularity around there, but it's not a given. So you, it's really um, up, to, up to you to, to be aware of those requirements. I, I, I will point out there's, um, an interesting uh, kind of uh, exceptional case for this K99R00. The BRAIN Initiative has its own K99R00. I see some of you are familiar with that. It's a, it's a diversity targeted K99. Uh, however, uh, in, in an exception for the general category of diversity oriented grants that the NIH has, uh, it does uh, include in the population they're trying to support women as well as underrepresented minorities. Um, and they also have somewhat looser requirements in terms of age uh, after the award. I think formally you can go up to five years okay. and I've been told you can actually ask for exceptions longer still, especially if, for example, you took time off from childbirth or whatever. Uh, I, I, I've been told that uh, they've never said no to somebody asking yeah, for an exception, you know, that had any kind of reasonable excuse. Uh, so obviously it doesn't fit everybody in this room, but uh, um, we have recently gotten a couple of those here. Um, it's a good mechanism um, and uh, it is a little broader, um, uh, at least from the diversity standpoint, uh, uh, support standpoint than some of the other awards and it's something, you know, that we should definitely consider as well. Right, right. I think, I believe all of the, all of the K awards allow for um, for an extension, if you have a, right. um, yeah, if, if you have family responsibilities, childcare, um, and so forth, I think those definitely count as valid reasons. I don't think I think what you can in that case you can choose whichever is later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because different institutions in different countries work differently, so so whatever is an official date, um, as you usually the conferring of your degree is later than your actual defense, and that's the official degree date. So you can go by that. Um, one thing maybe also to keep in mind practically is that often um, you apply to this award and maybe the first round uh, won't get funded, you want to reapply, you can resubmit um, a second time. And so, but you can only resubmit if you're still within those four years of your doctoral degree. 
So in terms of planning your very first submission, you might want to take into account how long that takes if you had to do another round of submission um, uh, in order to still fall within that four year category. It's another reason to do it a little sooner than later. Yes. Um, the, uh, so there's also something called a DP5, that's an early independence award. Um, this is a very um, highly competitive award. It needs institutional nomination. Um, it's really meant to be an award to skip your traditional postdoc. So it's really within the first year of um, applying uh, of your doctoral degree that you can apply for this. Um, so you you basically want to show that you have a track record or that you have had a really uh, successful doctoral thesis already, where, which already launches you to become a faculty really early on. So it's a very unique program, um, uh, but it does exist. Um, the Burroughs Welcome Fund is a, a um, is basically a non-federal opportunity that's effectively similar to the K99R00, and um, it, it's very similar in terms of the the mechanism, the the, uh, the it's, it's specific structure and funding is a little bit different, but it's it's very similar. So um, that one has I think a, sh a little bit of a shorter window, so it's up to sixty months after your um, postdoc. No, so it's actually, yeah, so 12 to 60 months. So it's, it's, it's again, very similar to the K99 application. And again, it's open to national and international uh, citizens. Um, all right. And then, so apart from those, there are other K awards, uh, a number of them. These are just a few examples. They are actually uh, a lot more than this. Um, but so for all of these other K awards, you have to either be a US citizen or a permanent resident. And they are, you. so the NIH, I guess, allows you to apply as a postdoc, um, uh, but you can also apply for these as a junior faculty. And they are meant to be really a, um, uh, still a mentored grant. There's a mentored, um, you, you make a case for having a mentored portion for four to five years. And um, sometimes that means a little bit pivoting the, your research direction or, um, uh, or, or really having a good case for, for why you need mentoring on top of the, uh, your existing um, uh, research uh, direction already. I'll have to say, while well, like in that KO1, it says for supportive postdoctoral or early career scientists, I've never actually seen one at the postdoc level. Now, I don't know whether that's just because competing against people that are further along and have their faculty positions, you're just considered less desirable or whether there's some other prejudice or maybe our postdocs just haven't applied. In general, they don't. They tend not to apply at the postdoc level for a K01. They tend to go for the K99. Um, but it's at least something that, you know, if you're really considering the K01 at the postdoc level, you may want to talk to the program officer and get a sense for, you know, whether in fact, you know, at your career stage, it'd actually be competitive. And at the very least, we don't have experience with this. And we typically will see it as, you know, at, you know, at kind of the instructor level. On occasion, we have had postdocs apply for them, um, but usually those will go along with like a letter, maybe from somebody like me or some other department, essentially committing to a faculty position. I've seen that work. So, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, Dave Tuck uh, got, you know, one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, that is possible. So if you essentially have a commitment, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, your department, um, you know, to provide you a faculty position, then I think that kind of puts you close enough to the uh, faculty uh, thing that uh, at that point, it seems like people are uh, competitive. And in some departments, like in psychiatry, I think that's actually the norm. People tend to apply as the, like a very senior postdoc with a commitment to the funding. Uh, of course, it's a little stronger if the letter says they're committed to giving you a faculty appointment regardless of whether you get the grant or not. Oftentimes, however, the letters are written that will give you the faculty position if you get the award. 
surprisingly enough, people seem to get away with that, and uh, at least in some settings, actually get those awarded. So let's just say there's some topic, uh, you know, for discussion, if that's a, a, a K that you're looking at. These issues don't come to bear, however, on the K99, which is really designed for postdoctoral work, and the commitment to faculty status comes later. You know, in, in many ways, the, those are easier conversations, you know, say for somebody in my position, because all, you know, I, for a K99, I'm just committing to support you as a postdoc. Um, you know, for a K01, I'm effectively committing to bring you onto the faculty, and that's, you know, a different kind of commitment. Right. Yeah, for, for all of those K awards, there there's an entire section of institutional support. So they, and that's actually an important part where you have to show that the institution wants you and, and wants to support you and they have to show how. So like having a faculty position lined up for you is obviously a very strong commitment, um, but but it, it is part of the application. That's why it's, um, it's important and it's not a fellowship anymore. It's not, it, it, it's really a career development grant. Um, uh, I think the other, the other note, maybe also if you do have or get one of these K awards, um, they do have a new uh, supplement that came out now that it can give you a little bit of extra money um, to support you if you do have um, a, a child care responsibilities or dependent care responsibilities um, that, uh, that you can get on top of those grants. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's actually a new, very, very new supplement that exists now. But you have to be the PI of a grant. Um, so, and then finally, there are all the research grants, um, R01, R21, uh, <laughs> a lot more than that. There, there are U grants, there are program grants. Um, we're not going to go into uh, details for that, and there might be a whole other why and how, um, but if you, uh, you know, if, if you are involved in writing some of these, um, that can be a good exercise that can um, give you, uh, sometimes you can be, be very much involved and really see that as a training for when you're applying for either your own K award and you already know all the documentation that goes into it or, um, or to really learn in, in a mentored fashion how to be involved in um, formulating your ideas and writing um, uh, specific aims and things like that. So Chris, presumably your mentors are soliciting, you know, your help uh, on their grants, but if they're not, you should volunteer, right? It is it's the best way to learn is to do and beyond your own grants, uh, you know, it's a chance to work intimately with somebody that presumably has some experience in grant writing and they're no doubt very appreciative. Uh, the more engaged you are, uh, the more you're going to get back from them in terms of the learning experience from the process. It's, it's a bit self-serving for me to be uh, promoting uh, that you work mm -hmm. hard on somebody else's grants, but I think there actually is a real payoff for that. So, I mean, I know before I ever had to write, you know, an R1, I had written several, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, my own, uh, and that was the only way I could have done it from having had that experience. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all we have. Uh, good luck for all the obligations, but we're, yeah, if you have any other questions, we can talk about that. Feel free to ask. Just remember that the, the grant, you, you know you're not going to get is the grant you don't write. So get out there, fix it up, <laughs> write a grant. All right, thanks. <laughs>